found yourself explaining to someone the state of your home who doesn't even live with you? <laughs> Maybe they show up unexpectedly, or you knew they were coming, and you just couldn't get together in time. So you find yourself in the hallway shoving something in the closet, maybe that stack of mail in the nearest drawer, and you say things like, I'm so sorry about the mess, it's not usually like this, it's been crazy lately. As if the excuses and the quick cleanup really makes a difference to the person who's already ankle deep in your living room of Amazon packaging, toys, underwear. <laughs> or maybe you're somebody who doesn't let people in your house at all. Maybe you don't want people to see the way you live. So the reason that we hide the way we live or we excuse it and make excuses for it is because mess can make us feel pretty vulnerable. And the reason that mess makes us feel so vulnerable is because it shows that we have a flaw, that we don't have it all together. And when we know that somebody doesn't have it all together, it can change our perception of them, or our perception of ourselves. Because face it, whether we have clutter or somebody else does, we judge them, and we think they can be a better partner, or a better parent, or maybe they're lazy, or they can do it in a better way. They don't have it all together. When we have mess, we think that means that we are a mess. So today I wanna to change the way you look at clutter. I want you to look at clutter as if it's not a personal failure, but personal information. Today, I want you to look at clutter like you're a professional organizer. I've been a professional organizer for 15 years, and I've seen a lot of common themes in the people that I declutter. The first one is, people want to know that they're not alone. They're not the only ones that are this bad. And, the second thing is, they want to know that if they're going to do this work, that they're not going to make a mistake. They're not going to get rid of something valuable or something that could change their life one day with this one item. That their life would be so much better if they just kept it. And they also want to know that there's an ending in sight. That this work isn't going to last forever. It's not going to be this tedious, hard, painful activity that they have to do over and over again. When people confront their clutter, they're also confronting their identity, and things might come up like things about their emotions or memories that they didn't expect. So when I go into someone's house, I like to see everything. Even if we're just working in one room, I want to see the whole house. And the reason for that is because that gives me more information about how they're living the disconnect they have with someone else in their home, things that they're attached to, the history of their stuff. So I go into a new client's house, and she knows why I'm there. She has a lot of clutter, she doesn't know what to do with it. I'm the one who knows something, what to do with it. So I come in, and the first thing she says to me is, I'm so sorry about the mess. <laughs> I, I didn't always do this. It didn't used to always be like this. Things have been crazy lately. I wanted to clean up before you got here, but I didn't have time. <laughs> and then, is this the worst you've ever seen? But here's the thing, it doesn't matter if this is the worst I've ever seen. You will never know if it's the worst I've ever seen. I will probably see worse, or you might be my worst. It doesn't matter, because those things aren't what I do. I don't measure if you're the worst. I measure your stuff, because gives me information. And every professional organizer has to see your clutter. So I don't want you to apologize. I don't want you to clean up before I get there. When I get to see the unaltered state of your mess, I get to see evidence of what's been going on in your life, and then I get to create a solution from it. So what if we looked at clutter the way a professional organizer does, what if we saw clutter as information and not as a personal failure? We saw it as a solution. We saw it as our personal history. Now, I told you that I'm a professional organizer, but what I didn't tell you yet is that I'm also a professional organizer who has ADHD. So, I'm in the curious predicament of being both the expert and the ideal client. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, when I was growing up, there weren't a lot of resources for people with ADHD. In the 90s, they put you on Ritalin, you might get some counseling, and then you better just figure out how to fit it, like, get it together. So as I got older, I started to struggle with things like planning or focusing my attention, completing tasks um, successfully. And this was due to a disruption in executive functioning and self-regulation. <laughs> and the thing is, we think about those things when it comes to ADHD, what we don't realize is that when there's a disruption in executive functioning or self-regulation, it can happen to anyone. It can happen when you're depressed. It can happen if there's loss or trauma. It can happen if you're going through cognitive decline. So we talk about clutter like it's this thing we're doing wrong, this personal failure. And then we're not looking at our history that led us there. And we're not looking at the disruptions in our executive functioning that everybody comes across in a lifetime. So you don't have to be a minimalist to declutter. You don't have to fold things in cute little triangles and put them away to get rid of your clutter. And you don't have to invest in hundreds of dollars of clear plastic bins and put things in rainbow order to t deal with your clutter. Those methods work for people, but it's not the core of the issue. Clutter circles around our disconnect from ourself and shows up in our things. So that's what I like to focus on when I am decluttering people. There's so many reasons that we have clutter. So we need to take a whole world approach to why it got there in the first place. We have things that happen in our life that are sad that lead to clutter, but there's other things like culture or community that influence how much stuff we have and why we think that we have to have it in the first place. And our role in how we take care of other people plays a, a huge part in why we keep our things. And it can lead to, it can come from depression or lack of resources, or even burnout from home or an uneven workload at work. So if we assign it to personal failure, we're ignoring all the things that we go through. And if we declutter, it might look nice for a little bit, but we're gonna get right back there again if we don't address these other issues. So it's not all in our minds, I have to admit. We can't just blame ourselves. I'm not thinking my way out of this enough. Society has a huge impact on why we have clutter as well. We need to unlearn what we've been taught by everybody around us. What our house is supposed to look like? How we're supposed to keep things organized? What are some social cues that you've had in your life that you've learned that have contributed to your struggle with clutter? Maybe it's that person who's always telling you how you can do things a little bit better in your house. They don't even have kids. They don't know. <laughs> or maybe it's you, you look at these skinny jeans and you say to yourself, I'm gonna keep these because I am in this terrible body right now. It's just temporary. I've only been in it for five years, but I will get back to those skinny jeans. Or maybe it's that shelf of books you have. And if one person could just come into your house and look at that shelf of books, they would know how educated you are, how interesting you are, how diverse your reading is. Or maybe you're the person who has to keep something in case something happens to everybody else in your life. Maybe you've got to have that extra dresser in your garage because you know a family member who's going to move into a house one day and you've got to have that infamous bag of bags ready. <laughs> <laughs> These are ways that we are influenced by the outside world and then we have so much piling up because of it. But here's the thing, society and the things that people outside tell us about how we're supposed to live, we have to realize they've also been conditioned. They also have their own history and memories that led them to believe what they believe about their belongings. So if that's the case, we have permission to reject that. We don't have to live the way they tell us to. Studies show that mind is linked to clutter more and more every day. Hoarding in people 55 and up increases with age. People who are going through cognitive decline 
tend to cling to their things as their memories are harder to control. People going through depression, studies have showed that there's an issue with taking care of self and taking care of home when you're in a depressive episode. Shifts in our mental state didn't used to be there before, but we have to prepare for when they come. And shifts in our life happen. If there's a tragedy, or we hit a period of poverty in our life, or if there's a house fire and we lose everything, this can change our relationship with our things. So we have to change the way we think about ourselves when we accumulate clutter. I have a client who, she's a lawyer, and her parents immigrated to the U.S. in the 90s. And when I started to declutter with her, she was still living at home, and so we were dealing with her as an adult, living at home and trying to figure out how to declutter her room while her parents are telling her what to do. And she was also navigating a career in law. But right outside her door, her parents' overwhelming clutter was evidence of moving to a country and starting over from nothing. And having to keep things to make sure that their family was safe, but also keep things to send back home for everybody else that didn't come with them. The responsibility of taking care of someone else and themselves and starting over new where they didn't know anyone before. So here we had under the same roof two sets of people. One who was dealing with living with her parents as an adult, a law career, and what she felt about living with her parents at that age. And then her parents who were dealing with the cultural impact and the familial boundaries of, of what they needed to do for their family back home. So is this really simply about failing? Is this really about not being good enough and not keeping up? We keep things to preserve our past and we prepare for the future. But what do we need right now? That starts with letting go. We become disconnected and that's when clutter builds up. So here's how we connect again. Here's how we stop looking at clutter as a failure and we bring it back into ourselves. We talked about earlier how clutter is information. So we need to find some data points. The easiest data point you can find is a before and after picture. I had a client who was working on um, a room in her house and it was full of stuff. And after her time session, she says to me, she goes, I feel like I didn't do anything. There's still mess there. There's, there's a lot of stuff here. And I told her, I was like, look at that before picture and take that after one. She compared the two and she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe that there was actually a difference. When she was in it, all she could see was the mess. But when she stepped back and she compared that data point, she could see that there was a change. The next one is to time yourself. You want to time yourself not as a competition with yourself to do more in less time. It's to be more cognizant of how long it actually takes you to process your memories, process your things, so that you don't set up unrealistic expectations the next time you want to declutter something. We've all been there when you take too much out of the garage. You think you're going to do the whole garage. You work on one corner and you realize you have eight hours of stuff to put back in. <laughs> why timing is important. The next thing is we want to change our language with ourselves about our clutter and the things that we go through. We want to tell ourselves that when we let go, that we have the capability to acquire it again, that we have the resources to do it again, that we have the brain power to figure out what to do if we cannot acquire that thing again. Because when you declutter, you are becoming a confident decision maker. You are saying what stays and what goes. And you are telling yourself you can resolve an issue if it comes up again. The next part is community. I'm a big believer that we heal through community. And during the pandemic, I was running an audio chat room every single day. And people would come in and we would declutter for 90 minutes together and people would share about what they were letting go of. And one lady would come in and she was really depressed and she was going through a divorce, she was in between jobs, and she was the primary caregiver of her three children. And every day she would come in and when she felt low, she would just sit and listen. She wanted to be a part of what we were doing. 
And when she felt good, she would get rid of a bag of a trash. She would do what she could when she had the power to. And she told us one day, she said, bit by bit I've been letting go and I've been more cognizant of my emotions. I know that when I'm low, I've got to take care of myself when I'm low. When I'm high and I have uh, more power in me, I can now do the things I need to do that day because I've got it in me. I'm listening to myself. Another woman came in and as she started to declutter, she realized she needs boundaries at work and at home. So she started to find power in saying no. Everything she let go of, she could now say no to herself and to someone else. So we have to remember that clutter doesn't mean that you're a failure. It's information. And we get to use that information to support ourselves where we are in life right now. If you're low, if you're missing someone, if you're in a big transitional phase, let's support ourselves where we are now by going through our things and becoming closer to ourselves. I want you to ask yourself this. When you declutter, what shows up in the empty space when everything's gone? What haven't you dealt with that all your things covered up? We have a mess. We got messy, we created a mess, but we are not a mess. Clutter is information. Clutter does not mean personal failure.